In this presentation, I cover the X in a Box ecosystem and the possibility to build a satellite at home. While building a satellite at home is very much a solution for students working from home as a consequence of the ongoing pandemic, that wasn't the original intention of the X in a Box solution. Rather, we were aiming at creating an ecosystem allowing institutions and the students to enter the space race with limited resources. The idea was to create a solution allowing students to learn about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, using space as an inspiration and hence create aerospace-related solutions such as a satellite, but without the huge cost normally expected entering such an endeavor. I'm first going to illustrate the background, which is a prerequisite to understand why we went this route, but also a debate point for the current institutional aerospace development invest, then a bit about learning or teaching philosophy, and then I'm going to cover the X in a Box ecosystem. Finally, I'm going to give some examples of its usage. Let's look at the current scenarios we have seen institutions such as high schools, colleges and universities. The high end institutions already have not only a physics lab, but a dedicated electronics lab with solder station, multimeter, oscilloscope, and tools, and in most cases, enough for each student. In the other end of the scale, we find high schools, and I'm not only talking about the United States, but the rest of the world, that have a computer lab, if even that. Institutions which are really hitting the aerospace curriculum hard also have a class 100,000 clean room, they have a vibration tables, thermo vacuum ovens, and a, an anechoic chamber. Finally, they have large budgets per students for consumables, allowing the electronic bills to be a once-off usage, mainly because the soldered circuits with components are hardly salvageable, but also because that is the norm. You, of course, don't need all that. But even if you just have solder stations and multimeters, you end up have to allocate a dedicated space with power outlets for this equipment, and then you got a lab. The lab has to be secured, insured, and maintained. Even that for many high schools are overwhelming. The economy of using an electronic curriculum in an institution can also be about the distribution of funds. A number of universities are considering retooling their labs to use our technology for the undergrads and then spend more money on the postgrads, allowing them to invest in more dedicated equipment. For example, they limit the number of oscilloscopes and instead get a vibration table. Yet another economic aspect is not of monetary value, but the value of time. Some Ivy League universities cannot afford the student spends time on old school soldering or breadboard techniques and are using our solutions because of the rapid result students can achieve and by that managing to squeeze more useful knowledge into a limited time frame. The next point is about learning and or teaching philosophy. The way we teach students in many subjects is by teaching the fundamentals first in a bottom-up approach. Many students can't see the bigger picture or they're not mature enough to understand why fundamentals has to be taught first. Like learning about derivatives and integrals in calculus, but without student practical use cases. Let me illustrate. Imagine you have to cast some roles for a movie. Let's choose a computer hacker and a math professor. In your head, create a description of the two characters. So I've used this example since we started in 2016. So this is the most frequent answers I get. The computer hacker is 19 years old, plus minus, funky whisk kit, and the math professor is a plus minus 60 year old tweet dressed male with a receding hairline. So ask yourself, how come a 19-year-old hacker has enough skills and knowledge to break into a three-letter agency in a subject he or she was never taught in school, in a subject that fundamentally changes every five years or less, while a math professor is only proficient in an old age, in a subject that is taught every year from great north and hasn't changed in 4,000 years? It is the way we learn. The hacker starts playing computer games with a working computer, but keeps losing to his friend. The friend tells him that he upgraded the graphics card so it runs faster. The hacker learns how to do the same, but still loses. Now the friend tells him that he modified some setting in some configuration file. Eventually, the hacker knows that if he has to win, he has to figure out how to tune his computer without asking his friend. 
10 years later, he's 19 and he's very proficient, not only in computer technology, but also learning and sourcing knowledge from the first corners of the internet. He started with a working solution, he got an out-of-box experience, and he started fixing his computer slowly without losing a functional computer. In the old days, he would first have to learn about resistors, then capacitors, then transistors, then circuitry, soldering, fault finding, etc. He would have started with a blinking LED, and many years later, with a computer, if he had the patient, and a school who would teach him and keep him motivated. So how can we achieve that, and how can X in a Box help us? So X in a Box is a modular collection of electronic circuits, mainly fitting in a 32 by 32 millimeter PCB, or any multiples of that. They click together with loose connectors, and you can build a circuit in minutes, if not in seconds. A circuit contains some sort of core, as we call them. A core is a microcontroller or MCU, but could be anything we could program. Instead of a core, you can also use a bridge allowing you to connect your circuit to a single board computer, such as a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone. Next, you need some input or some output. In our starter kit, we have two sensors, a weather sensor measuring temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure. And we have a light sensor measuring ambient light and ultraviolet light. Our output in this circuit is a small LED display, but since our core in the starter kit also is Wi-Fi connected, the data is also transmitted to a dashboard, which can be used as an output. Finally, you need power. In this case, we use power from USB. The USB power connector also works as a programming interface for the core. As I assembled this kit, I did it without needing any hardware knowledge. Just some ground rules about assembling X in a box circuit. I needed no tools, not even a screwdriver. I could do this at home or in a classroom, not dedicated for electronics building. A teacher could preload the software using a Windows or Mac computer, or the students could do it themselves if they have access to a computer. They can use the kit without anything but a power source, such as a $2 USB wall charger, or they can configure the kit using their smartphone and see the dashboard data there. We can also easily load another project to the core using the X in a Box uploader, such as a lighthouse demo that shines a light when the light levels drops below a given level. Here's another solution using another core, this time the CS11, which is the same as the Arduino Zero. The MCU is exactly the same. Only difference is that the CS11 has a SD card to record data locally. The power solution here is an IPO2. In this example, we program the CS11 using MakeCode. We read the ambient light level from the SL01, and then we display it on the OD01. Notice how the level changes as I put my hand over the sensor. In Exxon Box, we aim to support three levels of programming. The elementary level shown here is using MakeCode. The World Economic Forum stated in 2016 that we should learn to code the same year we started to learn our first second language. In Denmark, that was grade five when I went to school and started to learn English. Today, English is taught from grade one. They should learn to code from grade one and MakeCode is an ideal language for such. Our next level is Python. For the last number of years, the most utilized programming language. Some of our cores can be programmed in MicroPython, currently based on Python 3.4, and others in CircuitPython, which is a MicroPython fork. Our final level is C, C++ using Arduino, which is the language we support first when it comes to making libraries. One of our aerospace style kits are the XK07 first time developed for the Virginia Space ThinSat program. It consists of a flight station or satellite and a ground station. The flight station contains same sensors as the starter kit, but it also have a total volatile organic compound sensor, it's a CO2 sensor, and a 9 degree of freedom, IMU, and finally a GPS. Furthermore, the flight station runs on dual AA batteries which also works as a power sensor, giving voltage level and current draw readings. 
The flight station and the ground station communicates between each other using LoRa, a radio technology rapidly increasing in airspace use for its high link budget of 168 dBm, and its handling of frequency locking of fast-moving objects as the radio is using spread spectrum technology. On the ground station, the data is uploaded to a dashboard via an MQTT server using the same Wi-Fi core as in the starter kit. Another kit is the XK90, introduced as X in a Box, was chosen for the US Federal Department of Education's CubeSat Challenge last year. It is the XK07, but adding two PC104 boards, allowing the user to integrate the kit with other PC104-based CubeSat boards. Both kits come with a ready-made software and access to a dashboard, making them work straight out of the box, giving the students a top-down experience with something that can be put together and work in one day. The kits can be expanded using other sensors, other cores or bridges, such as the BRO3 Raspberry Pi zero bits, allowing the user to build a flight station or satellite using NASA's open source core flight system, CFS. Finally, I want to give examples how it has been used. Our first big customer was Virginia Space and their ThinSat program launched in 2017. I met Bob Twix in 2016 at SmallSat in Utah and showed him our solution, which he immediately got Virginia Space to buy into. Both our starter kit and the XK07 flight station and ground station kit was originally developed for these projects. However, both kits have changed vastly since then. As part of the SINSAT program, which was based out of Virginia, Old Dominion University have been using it with their undergrads since 2017. Princeton University were given the opportunity to fly on a second SINSAT mission and decided to use X on the box when they started an aerospace mechanics degree in 2018. The inaugural SINSAT flight took place just before the last Cal Poly CubeSat workshop, April 17, back in 2019. And 41 out of 55 satellites flew with the X in a Box technology using the same connectors and the same format. However, we did do a special black edition since we needed to move the sensor slightly to match the windows on the thin set. While X in a Box was only used for payload with a dedicated payload computer based on the CS11, just without the SD card, we call it the CCO3. We collected the data and sent the data to the SynSat mother CPU that uploaded the data using GlobalStar. We received data from all our sensors on the SynSat that was able to get radio contact. And despite the short duration of the mission, we have been told that we achieved NASA's technology readiness level 9. NASA's SETI organization also chose to try out Exynabox. Both in 2018 and in 2019, a project with a number of sampling stations went with a team to the Andes Mountains, which is an analog for Mars, back 3.5 billion years ago. In early 2020, a kit went with the Quest for Space's Fair Day Kate to the International Space Station and collected 1.5 million records in a one-month-long stay. Going up there with Antares NT11 and returning on SpaceX CIS 17. This experiment with other sensors though is being repeated again in June 3rd, going up with SpaceX CIS 22. Other schools and universities around the world have started using X in a Box as a means to continue education during the pandemic, such as Stanford University, which in a collaboration with NASA Ames are using X in a Box to teach aerospace in both undergrad as well as postgraduate levels. But now that they have been using X in a box, they don't see themselves going back to old school technology. We also are arranging space flights using the X in a box technology, such as the ISS mission I just mentioned, and on board the Blue Shift rocket with schools and University of Southern Maine had our XK90 on back in February. Blue Shift are launching their first suborbital rocket into space, so above the common line, in quarter one, 2022. Contact us via our US representative MaxIQ at maxiq.space or email info at maxiq.space. Thank you.